The Game of Life and How to Play It by Florence Scovel Shin. So in life, we have choices and our choices determine the actions we take and the actions we take usually ends up turning some kind of result in the external world. And what happens is based on that result, we evaluate our life and we say, well, our life is like this and our life is like that. And the more we take certain actions, the more we tend to get certain results, whether it's positive or negative. And the more we realize that there are certain things that are beyond our control and there are certain things that are within our control. Now, interestingly enough, one of our objectives as humans isn't to go out and try to figure out all the variables that we have within our control and focus on those elements so we can, like a maestro, orchestrate and like an artist paint, like an engineer, map out and build systematically the life we want to live. So as a result of that, we recognize that, hey, some people fall in their category where they see themselves as a cause and most people see themselves as the effect. And interestingly enough is the very important concept of social proof, which is a Robert Cialdini principle in influence of psychology of persuasion. If you look around and most people see themselves as an effect, then our brain makes it a reasonable assumption, which is actually a bias, to assume that that's the way it works. Okay, most of us are at the effect of circumstance and situations. Every now and then you'll come across a few people in your life because you know we already talked about this the majority see themselves as an effect. And these individuals see themselves as the cause. And they don't appear to be extremely powerful. I mean, they don't have, you know, they're not 7 foot tall and carrying with them a massive amount of genius and skill and so forth. But their orientation in life is that they believe that they are the cause or predominantly see themselves as the cause. And what you'll find is that usually these individuals tend to live the life that they want to live. Okay, they do the thing we mentioned earlier, where they see themselves as an artist, as an engineer, as an architect, and they handpick the things that they focus on that are within their control. And they do those things every day. They get feedback from that. They optimize from the feedback. They go back, they revisit it, and focus on elements that are within their control based on that feedback, and then come back and optimize to create success after success, just rapid fire, one after the other after the other. So this is something that I found to be true in my journey in studying entrepreneurs. I've been around, around a lot of entrepreneurs, and reasonably so because I was talking with a friend earlier today that I've dedicated most of my life trying to figure out how to create wealth, how to make money. Because I come from a background where we didn't have any wealth and we were very, um, let's say, modest in our living. And I hated it. I did not like that I couldn't afford to buy what I wanted to buy. So I created within myself what Napoleon Hill calls the burning desire, the burning desire to go out and figure out how to create wealth and how to be able to create it whenever I want it to be able to create it for whatever I wanted and never to be at the circumstance of lack of funds or resources available at my disposable to buy and do and experience what I wanted to experience. And something interesting happened when I discovered how it all works. I didn't stop there. I was so in the journey of trying to figure out how all this stuff works that I kept going and going and going and going and going. Many years later, I became you know, obviously, I built my IT business, grew it up really fast. I was able to sell off my clients, but I also became a consultant in which I work with many different companies, and I also have online training programs, and I create these videos to share with you my experience. But every time I put out a piece of content, every time I deliver a talk, every time I give a consulting session, I realize that there's way more to this than meets the eye. And so I got fascinated by it, and I go deeper and deeper and deeper into it. And one of the fundamental elements that I want to share with you, which is the key responsible factor for success, not just in entrepreneurship, but in just about any area of your life, 
it was universal that I found, and I wasn't the first one to figure it out, although everyone who figures it out believes that they're the first one to figure it out. That's what Earl Nightingale said in The Strangest Secret. Napoleon Hill figured it out. A lot of people have figured this out. I'm not the only one. And it's obvious because we've heard it before, and here's the quote. Whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. This means that whatever man sends out in the world or deed, in the word or deed, will return to him. What he gives, he will receive. If he gives hate, he will receive hate. If he gives love, he will receive love. If he gives criticism, he will receive criticism. If he lies, he will be lied to. And if he cheats, he will be cheated. What we try to do is we look at circumstances that happens in our life, and then we go and try to fight the circumstance and try to change the circumstance, which a lot of times is outside of our control. Sometimes it's within our control. A lot of times it's a long, arduous, frustrating journey to fight the circumstance that exists. One of the best ways that I found and is the key principle behind individuals who believe themselves to be and actually are able to create the results from the perspective of the cause is they change themselves within. Okay, they change themselves within. And when they change themselves themselves within, they find themselves in situations and circumstances and they start to even see elements that they didn't see before or circumstances that they didn't see before that are within their control and they can work with those elements to create the results that they want. This is very interesting. Okay, because in entrepreneurship, our job as an entrepreneur is to create value and put the value out in the marketplace and to create that value based on what the marketplace is looking for. So we can't just say this is what value is based on our arrogance or just trying to force stuff into the marketplace. But we got to connect with the marketplace. We got to get our finger on the pulse and we got to feel it out and we got to understand what they're looking for and what they're willing to pay for and create something that is needed and useful, valuable for them so that they can get value out of it, so they can get results out of it, so they can find happiness out of it, whatever it is that you're creating, app, software, information, physical products, food, whatever it is. And then what happens is that when you create that, you offer it, people pay you for it in return. It's a very, very simple, pragmatic, yet we tend to overlook this principle many times. And why is that so? Well, I believe that that's how the game of life works. The game of life is to build self-confidence that you are the cause rather than the effect. And we do this by recognizing the elements that we have control over and the elements that we don't have control over. And in my opinion, to focus on the highest and best use of these elements first, execute upon them, complete them, put them out there, and thus you will be rewarded because whatever you put out will come back to you. A lot of times I see this with aspiring entrepreneurs. They start a business and they don't make any money. They struggle. And a lot of times they close because most businesses fail after the first handful of years, if not the first year. And universally, I can tell just by looking at their business, not even too deep, just on a surface level, that what they are doing, what they believe to be of value is actually not what the marketplace finds as valuable. And again, as simple as pragmatic as it sounds, why is it that most entrepreneurs make this mistake? Well, this goes back to my earlier point in that we're wired to look around to see what everyone else is doing. And if everyone else sees themselves as an effect rather than the cause, then a lot of times we are going to mimic those behaviors. Remember, this stuff gets programmed into our subconscious mind. We're going to talk about this in a moment. But we're going to start behaving like everyone else who sees themselves as an effect. And as a result, we will be doing things, even creating products or services as an entrepreneur, that is a self-fulfilling prophecy towards failure of the effect. Okay, now, this is something that I found to be true many times. That being said, we want to focus on sound principles when we are working with life. Okay, sound principles. And contained within this book are many sound principles. Contained within the books that I covered, many, many sound principles. The more you integrate these principles, the more you'll find yourself to be at the cause of not random things, but of worthwhile things, things that are actually valuable, leverage points, that when worked with, that when executed upon, 
produces results of a positive nature, which shapes your life. So let's talk about some of these rules in the game of life and how to play it. And it's going to be based on the book, and I'm going to also be sharing some quotes from As a Man Thinketh. And I recommend that you read that book too. I did a video on that. I probably will do an updated video on that. Put a link in the description. Let's go ahead and get started. All power is given man through right thinking to bring his heaven upon his earth. And this is the goal of the game of life. The simple rules are fearless faith, non-resistance, and love. Okay, Fearless faith, non-resistance, and love. If a person were to focus on these three elements on a daily basis, okay, in the game of entrepreneurship, which is part of the game of life, or any area of their life, they will find themselves in situations where they are the cause and they will remove themselves from situations where they have no control over, in which the statistical probability of them being the effect and failing is higher. Okay, fearless faith, non-resistance, and love. Well, why is this so? Let's just go one level deeper into this. The truth is that we all know what we have to do to produce the results that we want. Think about it. Every one of you watching this video right now probably has a very good idea of the thing that you need to do today, this week, this month, this year. You know what it is. And if you think about whatever it is that you have to do, and if it's the thing that you know that's going to produce the results, chances are, if you're not doing it, it's because you're fearing to some degree. You don't have the faith that by doing that thing, you're going to get the result. And so what happens is because you think that you're not going to get the result, you're going to take you know, a half-step action towards that, and you're not going to get the results, and the self-fulfilling prophecy of the external world will be reflected onto you, because as you believe, as you shall receive. So that being said, what we have to do is we have to say, look, we kind of live in a reality right now that's been programmed consciously and subconsciously by our environment, by ourselves, by circumstances, etc. This is created the reality that we have right now. And if we want to level up and we want to grow and we want to create success, then we're going to have to change our paradigm around. We're going to have to look at reality different. Paradigm is how you see reality. Those that have a high level of success, wealth consciousness, for example, have a different paradigm than those that struggle to find success and may not have that wealth consciousness. Same thing applies for health consciousness, love consciousness, whatever kind of consciousness. All that is a paradigm. Now, the interesting thing about paradigms is that the paradigm keeps you where you are right now. Not because you're evil and you want to put yourself down, but because that's how you see reality. If your reality were to change and you were to see reality rapidly different over the next couple of seconds, you might be disoriented and you won't be able to make sense of what's going on and it could probably lead to a large level of anxiety and, and so forth. So the paradigm keeps you where you are right now. So it's actually a good thing in a lot of ways. However, if it's success that we want, if it's a higher level of results that we want, one of the things we have to aim to do is we have to change our paradigm around. And that's why in the personal development industry, in business consulting, entrepreneurship, and so forth, a large emphasis is put on overcoming fears. Because fears are what keep you in your current paradigm. It's one of the things. And the only way to overcome our fears is to do the thing that we fear. Okay, do the thing that we fear, provided it is a worthy thing to do. All right? Now, each one of us got to exercise judgment on that and what is worthy and what is not. But the truth is the truth, and that the paradigm will always remain the same unless we take bold actions. And here's the interesting thing. We know the actions we have to take. We just don't take them because we think that the circumstances have power over us. We can't do it because of that person or because of this or because of that. Well, one of the things that I found in the entrepreneur's journey, and I've been an entrepreneur now for full-time, nine years, but I've been one my whole life, is that this is an ongoing daily activity, okay? Daily activity, unless 
you want to get to a certain point and remain there. And you can't really do that because the world is evolving. People are taking bold action every day. So you can't really stay the same where you are. So the gravitational pull for evolution is to step out of your comfort zone, is to move into fearless faith. Now we're talking about faith here. We're not just talking about fearlessness. We have faith and we know it in our heart based on our intuition that the actions we take, the faith, are going to produce the result. Now, it could produce the total result or it could produce a step closer of insight towards the result. But one thing will be absolute and that is this. If you do not take action, if you do not move forward past your fear, you will remain where you are right now. Now, a great video to watch is one that Bob Proctor did on the terror barrier. I re recommend you watch that video a thousand times. Okay, just watch it over and over again. I'm going to put a link in the description. And he discusses it and gets into deep detail. And maybe I might do a video on, on paradigms, but he talks about it really well because he spent most of his life studying paradigms. Okay, and he's got a huge body of knowledge, and I really recommend his material. So non-resistance is another element. Non-resistance. Think about this for the moment. There's a saying, what you resist persists. How many times do we take an action and we create unnecessary resistance in our mind only to have that action come out suboptimal, throttled, stifled? Think about this for a moment when it comes to public speaking. Okay? If you've never done any public speaking before and you go and do it for the first time, What's one of the first things that you experience? And you'll, find, you'll probably find that you're not able to articulate yourself as clearly as you can, as you know you can. You might have a lot of information that you want to convey, but for some reason it doesn't come out. And some of the reasons why that doesn't come out is because we're putting up a persona. We put up a front. Why do we put up a persona and why do we put up a front? Because we're scared. We're scared that people will not accept us for who we are. Now, this is a natural part of overcoming your fears, so you're not wrong to feel that way. But that right there is an act of, non -re of resistance. Okay? That's an act of resistance. If you were non-resistant, if you practice non-resistance, and I recommend taking inventory of all the areas in your life, because I believe in how you're doing one thing is how you do everything, where you are practicing resistance, and systematically overcome those elements to recognize that when you remove resistance in one area, it removes resistance in another area of your life. And when you find yourself in a situation where you have to communicate eloquently, you will. This is something that I've worked on because I get people that ask me, how did you improve your communication skills? Well, if you'd met me 10, 15, 20 years ago, you would know that I do not express myself the way I express myself right now. I went to work on these areas, and what I worked on was removing the resistance from within. Removing myself from environments that create resistance. Fighting against circumstances rather than changing the cause within. That is a form of resistance. Okay? Doing the same thing over and over again and getting the same results and getting frustrated. That's a form of resistance. Going through an experience having it not work out and blaming the other person who was participating in that experience with you is a form of resistance. Taking responsibility and looking to see how you could have solved the issue either preemptively or not find yourself in that same issue again or resolve it better in the dynamic of the present as the issue is happening is a form of non-resistance. It's about looking at elements from a reality perspective. Why? Because you accept things for the way they are. When you accept things and you accept people and you accept circumstances for what they are, okay, realism here, and not putting a disempowering meaning onto whatever that is, then you are practicing non-resistance. Now, there's a lot to this. Okay? There's a lot to non-resistance. I mean, Gandhi made a whole life work on the concept of non-resistance. Plenty to be studied and researched on non-resistance. And then number three is love. Okay, I'm from the school of thought that, and the belief system that I do not do anything that I do not love to do, period. I don't do it. 
in earlier stages of my life, when my self-esteem was lower, when my self-confidence was lower, when I didn't appreciate and value myself, I would do things that I didn't love to do. And when things didn't go my way, I would blame circumstance. I would blame people. I would say the reason why I didn't get what I want was because of them or this or whatever. When I started to recognize that, hey, look, as an entrepreneur, and that's why I always recommend the entrepreneur's journey, we have to, and I'll quote Jay Abraham, fall in love with our clients. Okay, fall in love with our clients first, because then when we do that, we can figure out what needs, what wants, what pains, what frustrations they have, how to communicate for them, how to care for them, how to nurture them to the point where there is no other viable solution other than the services that you have. They would not look anywhere else. When you can do that, the game changes. Okay, The game of life is in your favor as far as entrepreneurship goes. But that has to be authentic. Okay, You can't fake that. So one has to dedicate time every day to explore love, to see love in themselves, to love others. Because you cannot tap into that abundance of riches that you would get as a net result of falling in love with your clients unless you knew what love is. And this is an ongoing thing. Okay, a lot of people might think they know what love is, but they don't practice self-love. Okay, they don't appreciate themselves. And here's one of the biggest lessons that I've learned in life, one of the most important lessons. If you can't love yourself, if you can't value yourself, if you can't appreciate yourself, then what you're looking for in another person or people or money or circumstances is completion. And while you get it temporary, it'll fall away. But if you learn to appreciate and love yourself, and I recommend reading Six Pillars of Self-Esteem by Nathaniel Brandon. I did a video on that. I'll put a link in the description. When you learn to love yourself and appreciate yourself and be okay being by yourself, I mean really, and having more fun by yourself than you would with anyone else, then you're onto something really powerful. Then you understand to a deep level what love really is. Then you can act fearlessly with faith. Then you will have less resistance. You will be practicing non-resistance, and the game of life will get better and better and better. So let's talk about some elements here. There are three departments of the mind, the subconscious, the conscious, and the superconscious. Okay? The conscious mind has been called mortal or carnal mind. It is the human mind that sees life as it appears to be. It sees death, disaster, sickness, poverty, limitation of every kind, and it impresses the subconscious mind. So in other words, it's the conscious mind that programs the subconscious mind. It, it impresses the subconscious mind. Now, the conscious mind is the thinking mind. Okay? It's the logical mind. It serves a purpose. It's very important. Why? Because if we can consciously make educated decisions as to where our attention, our awareness goes, then we program the subconscious mind, which doesn't take directions the same way as a conscious mind does, but it acts based on the information subconsciously, unconsciously. That's what we want to do. So by using the mind, and you know, as you believe, so it shall be done unto you, and as you think, you shall receive. Okay? We have to think properly. We have to think clearly. In the world we live in today, we have abundance like you can't imagine. You can create whatever life you want faster than any time in history. But if you're not gearing your mind towards thinking and consuming the right information that's going to nurture and grow you, then you are potentially leaving yourself open to becoming part of an uncontrollable circumstance. Okay, we want to focus on information that is related to our goals. We have to know clearly. Okay, one of my favorite laws from the 48 Laws of Power is plan all the way till the end. Okay, know exactly what you want in your life. This can be overwhelming for a lot of people. But this is, this is something we have to realize is this doesn't happen over, overnight. You get clearer as you evolve. You start to know as you go through life what you want and what you don't want, and you should get to a certain point where you know on certain matters exactly what you want and exactly what you don't want. And based on that, based on that, you will move your attention and awareness and focus 
over to the things that you have control over to hit your objective while enjoying each moment of the journey. Because this is not about trying to get to a destination and that's it. This is about enjoying the journey. You have many ways to get to the journey. Now, I remember this metaphor. One of my mentors told me in earlier stages of life, and it was all about what business to be part of. And he said to me, he said, look, you can get to a multi-million dollar business through many vehicles, but what vehicle are you going to take to get there? Are you going to get there in a nice car, you know, a Jaguar or something like that where it's comfortable and you enjoy the journey? Or are you going to get there on this beat up car, uncomfortable, unsafe, unenjoyable? How are you? How do you want to do it? He's like, you can pick whatever you want. Don't ever think that you have to do it in a way where it's unenjoyable. You know, and that was a metaphor that really shaped a lot of my decisions in life. And I'll tell you, I heard it at a very young age and I didn't in integrate it. And it was only in later stages in life when I really started to put emphasis on that. And now with everything I, I do, I ask myself, I'm like, wait a second. If I'm going to get to the destination, I know I'm going to get to the destination. Everything I put my mind to in my life, I accomplished because I put in effort, work, action, optimization, elements that I cover in the videos and these great books that we read and so forth. It's a systematic process. I'm going to get there, but I want to enjoy the journey as well. And believe me, I've been through stages. Uh, there was a portion of time when I was building my IT business where I became very serious. I was unpleasant, okay, very serious. I focused just on making money. Now, granted, I was driven and I wanted to grow my business. But one of the things that happened as a result of that is I didn't like being around myself because I just could not have any fun. I was very unpleasant and it was very stuck in my head. And then I evolved. I said, you know what? I really need to integrate that lesson I learned at an earlier stage of my life. And I need to also have fun. I could do both. It's not going to sacrifice the quality or the vigor. If anything, it's going to contribute. And it really does. So now I'm at the stage of my life where I make that decision. If I'm not having fun doing the business deal or doing the project, I'm just not going to do it. Now to each their own, okay, varying degrees. But I found this to be very rewarding. Okay, this is where... When you wake up in the morning, if you're doing what you love to do and it's profitable and you're creating value and you're helping others and you are excited to do it, you love doing it, this is where you don't want to go to sleep and you don't, when you wake up in the morning, the first thing you think about is what you're going to do in relation to your projects. And it's a very, very beautiful thing to, to do and it is something that contributes to loving yourself, respecting yourself. And we, we discussed earlier to a light degree what the benefits of that is. So we have the ability to consciously pick what we want to focus on. Focus on the elements that will contribute towards your vision. Know exactly what it is that you want in your life and move towards that vision. Pick the vehicles that will allow you to have the most fun along the way. Now, this is my way of doing things. There's many ways of doing things. Is this the best way? I don't know. But this is based on my experience. This is based on working with many entrepreneurs. And I find this to be a sweet spot, doing what you love to do. Because nowadays, there's tons of things. There's tons of things that you could do that you can build a business around. Tons of careers. Okay, something that passionate, that's passionate for you might not be passionate for somebody else. Once you start, a lot of times what happens is people like to look around and see what brings somebody else happiness. And they want to do what that person is doing. Because they see the happiness. And they say, well, if I do what that person is doing, then that's going to make me happy. That's not necessarily true, you see, because only you can discover within yourself what brings you happiness. And we got to start listening to ourselves, okay? Marketing, advertising, the external world is always trying to tell you that their way is the best way. And, you know, it's not that they're sinister. Even as you listen to my videos, I might sound very adamant or motivated to share my way. But it might not be the best way for you, or there might be portions and elements of it that might contribute to your journey. I mean, that's my aim. But I speak to a certain audience, a certain group of people that want to live a certain way. So the, the, the message is very pure and very specific. But the bottom line is this. You pick and you choose consciously what goes into your mind. Make sure that these are elements that empower you, that orient you towards the cause being the cause and circumstances that you have control over or what you have control over, I should say, rather than being the effect. Okay. A person knowing the power of the word becomes very careful of his conversation. 
He has only to watch the reaction of his words to know what they do, that they do not return void. Through his spoken word, man is continuously making laws for himself. Okay, this is very interesting. I did a discussion in a book, What to Say When You Talk to Yourself, and I'll put a link in the description. The words we choose, how we believe reality to work, how we communicate to others and ourselves is going to be in the, the passion and the specificity and the clarity of our communication is going to be determined what goes into your subconscious mind to bring about the equivalent because we haven't talked about the subconscious mind yet. I did a video on the power of the subconscious mind, put a link in the description. And when we can use our words, when we can identify through our words what is going on internally, something interesting happens. I can sit there and have a conversation with someone. And based on the words that they choose and how they articulate themselves and what they talk about and where their attention goes, I could tell a lot about the person because it reveals their subconscious mind. Now, we could do this with ourselves. The words we use when we're alone, when we're having a conversation with ourselves in our own mind, when we're talking to ourselves in front of the mirror, the words we use when we're communicating to others, those that we care about, as much as we think we are influencing the other world, and while that may be true, what we're doing is we're revealing ourselves to ourselves. And when you start to look at the words that you use and the sentences you make and what it is that you're saying, like a scientist would, and say, what does that actually mean? Those words are elements that are coming from the subconscious. I mean, they're consciously chosen, but the nuances and the energy of where it comes from comes from the subconscious. How does that relate to the reality that I live in right now and the reality that I want to create? And you can go to town on this one. You could spend days, weeks, months analyzing and studying yourself, which I believe is a form of self-respect to study yourself. Okay, Before we go out there and try to change others, what we need to do is change ourselves and we'll realize the truth that you can't really change others. People will change the way they want to change. You can only inspire others by your way of being and your way of being projects the words outwards. The energy that flows out of you is really from the state of being. When you start to evolve in your communication style, you'll find that you will speak more from the subconscious. It will be a subconscious stream that flows through you. And the more fetters of the mind and the more resistance we remove from ourselves, the purer the communication. And if your communication is not pure and it doesn't come from a place of love, then it doesn't have that much of a positive impact on the world and the people around you. What we want to do is we want to purify our thoughts. We want to cleanse ourselves from impurities and go to work on that. And then remove the resistance layers and allow the words to flow out of you from that place of purity. It is those words that flow out of you in which you create, in which you communicate. You know, everybody's in entrepreneurship wants to become a better salesperson, be become a better dealer. One of the things that I found is the best dealers, the best salespeople are authentic. They speak from the heart. Yeah, they study persuasion. They study copywriting. They study direct response marketing, consultative selling, which I recommend everyone do. But one of the things they work on is themselves. Okay, They purify themselves because we're not trying to trick people to buy things. What we're doing is we're saying, we create valuable products and services for the right people that will benefit from these products and services. And we're looking to find where those people are and we're communicating and bridging the gap from where they are to where they want to be through our products and services. And that's what's being communicated clearly through the communication. When people go to work on copywriting, a lot of times they focus on the tactics. Okay, they're not looking at the energy of where it comes from. This is very important. So observe yourself and the conversations you have with yourself and others. And let that be an insight into your subconscious mind. And if you find impurities and you speak of impure elements, try to look at to see where it comes from and resolve those matters. 
But if you resolve those matters, your life will tend to improve. That's part of the game of life. Man receives only that which he gives. The game of life is a game of boomerangs. Man's thoughts, deeds, and words return to him sooner or later with astounding accuracy. Okay? Man's thoughts, deeds, words return to him sooner or later with astounding accuracy. In the, Kab in the Kabbalan, one of the things that comes up is the important element of as within, so without or your external world being a reflection of the internal state. Who you are internally is reflected in your external world. This is the law absolute. And this might be a tough pill to swallow in the beginning, but we have to hold the space and we have to connect the dots before we realize how true this actually is. And when you start to embrace that and you start to work with it, interesting things start to happen. When you change the cause within, the external world begins to change. And then you really start to recognize this important point here that thoughts, deeds, and words return sooner or later with astounding accuracy in the circumstances that are created based on what you're projecting from within. As a being of power, intelligence, and love, the lord of his own thoughts, man holds the key to every situation and contains within himself that transforming and regenerative agency by which he may make himself what he wills. Okay? That's from as a man thinketh. So the conscious mind, we have to control and direct where our attention goes. We have to pick wisely the words we use when we communicate to ourselves and others. By doing that, we program something that has a greater power over us, our subconscious mind. Okay? The subconscious is simply power without direction. It's like a stream steam or electricity and it does what it is directed to do it has no power of induction so the object of the game of life is to see clearly one's good and to obliterate all mental pictures of evil this must be done by impressing the subconscious mind with the realization of good so it's the subconscious mind that gets programmed by the conscious mind and this is what advertisers aim to do you ever wonder why you're interested in buying a whole bunch of useless things well, a lot of times it's because you were programmed by advertising or the external world saying you need those things to feel complete, which is another reason why we want to focus on creating love for ourselves and feeling complete for ourselves, because then what we look to experience comes from a more authentic and caring place for ourselves and a real valuable place rather than needing elements, buying stuff or looking to the external world to complete us. So we have to determine what it is that we want, and we have to recognize that the subconscious mind is the reactive mind, and we can program it by the thoughts we have, by the emotions that we have. And it's a subconscious mind that will drive automatic behaviors, automatic actions. Those that have, for example, wealth consciousness that has been either programmed or experienced programming through their environment because they grew up in maybe an affluent environment and so forth have within themselves subconscious programming in which they automatically do things that create wealth. I met with an interesting business owner a few months ago and what I found to be really fascinating about him is that he couldn't really explain how well he was able to make the kind of money he was making. He was making very good money and he lives a life of very uh, high abundance and he's very young. So what did I do? Well, I recognize how this stuff works. So I started to interview him, you know, not in an intrusive way, but I really wanted to know how he sees reality, okay, how he believes reality to work. And we started getting deep into his subconscious. And I started to realize and he started to realize this as well, because he said, wow, no one has ever, you know, kind of studied me this way before. No one has ever really analyzed it. And it's very interesting. I've never done it on myself. But what I've discovered is that he would learn things really fast from books, mentors, life experiences. It would program his subconscious mind. He wouldn't know how those experiences programmed his subconscious mind. But in given circumstances that would exist or dynamics of present moments in various areas of business, he would be able to call upon the optimal action okay, the optimal insight. And he would be able to do it intuitive by nature. 
without thinking, without analyzing, without doing the charts, without mapping and looking at spreadsheets. You know, and I'm a fan of that stuff too. Yeah, I believe that there's always a time and place for that. But here's somebody that can make a lot of decisions without looking at complexity. And so I recognize that the reason why he was able to do this is because his subconscious mind was programmed and he surrounds himself with information that programs his subconscious mind to do these high level, high business output actions automatically based on stimulus that was provided in the environment. This is not some kind of magical art or anything like that. This is, if you think about this for a moment, that's what fighters do in the arena. Okay, UFC fighters, athletes do this also. If you're an athlete, I'm sure you can recognize this. Programmers, computer programmers do this. Great orders, high level, anyone in any area of life, mastery, those that have achieved mastery in a craft, are able to, in the given moment, do the optimal thing. What is really going on? Where is this coming from? Well, that's coming from the subconscious. So now we realize even more so why it's so important to program the subconscious mind. This should be something that we need to do on a daily basis. This is something that I've been doing for many years. And I guard my mind. Okay? Consciously, I guard my mind. Okay? A lot of people know this about me who've met me. I'm very selective on where my attention goes. I've programmed myself to be this way. And what I share with you in this content is a net result of consciously guarding my mind, conscious, and programming my subconscious mind to best practice behaviors towards entrepreneurship, okay? becoming an entrepreneur growing as an entrepreneur, contributing as an entrepreneur, building other entrepreneurs. This is my passion. And so all the information and everything that I surround myself with contributes towards that outcome 100% of the time every day. And I have fun doing it. Okay, I get to hang out with some interesting people. I have amazing life experiences. And I feel purposeful. Now, Maybe entrepreneurship is not for you, but understand this, that a lot of who I am and a lot of anyone who's created any results in life is, is the net result of conscious programming, either being aware of the programming or not through the external environment and stimulus coaches, mentors, etc. to become unconsciously competent, as they call it, okay, unconsciously competent. And that is a element, a projection a aspect of the subconscious mind. Okay, the subconscious mind does a lot more powerful things than that. Okay, we can use this power. What I'm saying is the subconscious mind is very powerful and we could use this power. We have access to it. Read The Power of the Subconscious Mind by Joseph Murphy. So desire is a tremendous force and must be directed in the right channels or chaos ensues. Now, I put this quote in here very important. I brought up a point earlier. One of the things that I've always been really fascinated about is the criminal mind. And the reason why I've always been fascinated by it, because here you have these individuals who are brilliant, a okay, brilliant, very, very successful in uh, creating money. However, they end up going down a different path in life. And they end up hurting themselves, they end up hurting others. And a lot of times they end up in jail, or end up, you know, getting killed or so forth. And if only they had some guidance and something that was there that would reveal to them an alternative way in which they can channel their massive amount of quick wit, understanding, focus, discipline, and drive towards creating something that would make them even more wealthy and contribute to the lives of others. If only they had that kind of stimulus that would be an amazing thing. Okay, that would be very amazing. So the bottom line is this, is that in our lives, we have choices. We can get to our destination and arrive there, harming ourselves and harming others. Or we can get to the destination happy, contributing to others, contributing to ourselves, growing ourselves. And what we have to do is connect that with our desire. Okay, have the burning desire to create the success that you want. But recognize that you can create that success by looking at cause and effect and doing things the right way because there is cause and effect and there are implications for doing things the wrong way. 
Now, this might sound kind of complex, but at the end of the day, this is something that a lot of people do not do. And it's not just in success that people don't do this. They don't realize based on the food that they eat, the people that they associate with, the relationships that they join, they don't see the long term implications of that. And as a result, they end up in situations that are disheartening, that are troublesome, that cause a setback in their life, which now requires a lengthy recovery period. It messes up their psychology. Okay, a lot of things can happen. So thus, from this day forth, we have to make a commitment to ourselves that yes, having a burning desire is important. But recognizing what are the important areas of your life, you can create success, wealth, success and have the relationship have the health have the friends have the contribution. Okay, the important areas of life that are fulfilling for a human being, we can create all those things based on directing our desire down r certain channels and making decisions. Every time you make a decision, we get better at this. Think about the long term implication of your decision, the short term implication, the impact that you have on the lives of others, and the impact it has on your goals, because you know, perfect example, you can create a lot of wealth in your life and then ruin your physical health in the process, okay, just eating a bunch of junk food, because you're stressed out. You can also acquire a large amount of success with health and fitness, but then your financial health is out of whack, or your relationships are out of whack. You could be very good with your relationships. But you might not have the financial wealth, and which then will inevitably usually end up putting a strain on the relationship. So my view is to try to hit on as many of these areas with decisions to move them all forward. And believe me, it can be done. I believe in entrepreneurship, for example, I link my fitness towards my entrepreneurial goals, I know that by eating well, and that by exercising, and I haven't missed a workout in many years, and that I'm contributing towards better creation products and services contribution as an entrepreneur. I also know that my relationships, those that I choose to be intimate with those that I choose as a life partner or a friendship or whatever, is going to have a direct impact on my contribution. And on the flip side, a direct impact on their contribution, you know, because what we want to do is we want to surround ourselves with people that see reality this way, so we can get the optimal now granted, as I said this earlier, many ways about going and doing things. But if we cut corners, if you cut just one corner, we've already identified this, there is a effect for that. And it may show up. And if it shows up, it can be kind of painful. So the next element is the super conscious mind. Okay, this is very, you know, metaphysical concept here. And Napoleon Hill talks about this as the infinite intelligence, okay, the infinite intelligence, which is where all ideas, sources of hunches, inspirations come from. This is the connected mind. Okay, this is like the they call it the God mind. The super conscious mind is the God mind within each man and it is the realm of perfect ideas. There is a perfect picture of this in the subconscious mind. It usually flashes across the conscious as an unattainable ideal, something too good to be true. This is where hunches and inspirations come from. One has to tune themselves to that level of thought. Okay, Napoleon Hill talks about this in thinking grow rich. And they edited down the earlier if you can get your hands on the early manuscript of thinking grow rich, they edited the words out because this part seemed kind of weird to a lot of people. And the, the, they didn't feel that the world was going to be ready for this kind of information. And a lot of people will feel skeptical towards this, but understand one thing that if you find anyone that was a creative genius, creative artist, genius, brilliant entrepreneur or whatever, a lot of times they feel that their hunches and inspiration and ideas come from a power greater than themselves. So what is this and how can we work with it? So chapter nine in the book, the perfect self expression or divine design, there's some ideas, some thoughts we need to think about that stimulate the connection to the infinite intelligence. There is the each man, there is for each man, perfect self expression, there is a place where he is to fill, and no one else can fill. 
something which he is to do, which no one else can do. It is his destiny. Well, I can speak from experience on this one that at certain points in my life, I didn't feel that I knew what I was here to do. And as I went through the journey, I started to recognize my strengths, my weaknesses, and the areas that when I focus on contribute to the lives of others. And as an entrepreneur, it pays me really well. And I started to find the sweet spot, okay, something that I was passionate about doing something that in which I got paid really well, something that really surrounded me with the right kind of people that brought out the best in me. And it was actually areas that were based on my skills, which I had to develop, obviously, you know, skills, sometimes you might be natural at something, but a lot of times, even the best athletes in the world have to continuously work on developing their skills. When you find what that is, it, I, I can't describe the feeling, it's hard to put it in words. But there's a sense of peace. And I remember that I didn't think that it was possible a while back. I didn't think that that was even something that would even exist. So I can honestly vouch from it, at least from my perspective, that there really is for each person something that they do really well. And maybe a lot of people don't discover what that thing is because they don't have a burning desire to discover what that is. So how do you discover what it is? Well, I think it has to come from a place of love place of contribution. At a certain point in entrepreneurship, for example, you recognize you know, earlier stages, you just want to make money as fast as you can. But in later stages, you want to do things the proper way. And you recognize that, hey, you might as well do things the proper way the right way. Because there's far more money to be made in doing things the right way. And there's far more joy and benefit and peace of mind when you do things the right way. So why not just do it the right way? When you start to go down that direction, you start to realize even more so that it's important to fall in love with your clients, with your prospects, with your market. And then something interesting happens. Then you start to make that your purpose, okay? creating value for others in which you get paid really well, and then reinvesting back to creating more value in others. Then you start to realize your unique abilities, your skills, your talents, and then your life starts to change and it starts to evolve. But someone has to go down that path. And, you know, I think people find this path in many areas of, my, of their lives through art, through different kinds of creative expressions and so forth. I found it through entrepreneurship. And maybe that is a path because I kind of see it this way. We're all entrepreneurs. Okay? We all are creating value for others. Some of us get paid to do it. Some get paid really well to do it. And others don't really get paid that well to do it. And I believe that when a person finds their destiny, they're able to get paid really well for what they do, or they get rewarded in a way that they want to be rewarded, because it's not just about making money. Okay, some people like the rewards to be a certain kind of reward that's not money. But they feel that they're being rewarded really well, even if it's just a self gratification. Okay? And when they find that reward that they receive, as a result of what they do, I believe that they're tapping into and if not already have found and they just need to meditate upon it more to strip away the unessentials and so forth. They found their destiny. Okay, so think about that. The perfect plan includes wealth, health, love and perfect self esteem. This is the square of life which brings perfect happiness. When, hun when one has made this demand, he may find great changes taking place in his life. For nearly every man has wandered far from the divine design. So in order to connect to the infinite intelligence, and Napoleon Hill talks about this in Thinking Grow Rich, one has to have a burning desire and recognize the holistic nature, okay? health, wealth, love, self-expression, and so forth, and has to believe and have faith, okay? fearless faith, that they were it was their birthright to have that. Often fear stands between the man and his perfect self-expression. Stage fright has hampered many a genius. This may be overcome by the spoken word or treatment. The individual then loses all self-consciousness and feels simply that he is the channel for infinite intelligence to express itself through. This is something that is found by those that are artists, musicians, athletes, programmers, celebrities, people that are influential, okay, world leaders, great orders, 
they say that we let go of their self-consciousness and the stream of words flow from them, which one can say, as we said earlier, is from the subconscious mind, or it just may be from infinite intelligence. Now, this is something that requires faith. That's the beauty of this, is Napoleon Hill talks about infinite intelligence being one of those elements that one can only experience after they have gone through a lot of different elements and that most people don't believe it to be possible or will not have access to it to the degree where they can call upon it on their will to be able to guide their communication towards a worthy ideal of inspiration towards others, creative outlets, whatever it is. Another way is my way, not your way, is the command of infinite intelligence. Like all power, be it steam or electricity, it must have a non-resistant engine or instrument to work with, and man is that engine or instrument. When we start to remove the resistance from within, the energy flows through us. Okay? And this is where real creativity and high level of success at really high levels start to manifest. And we work towards that ideal. Okay? We work towards that ideal in a very, very pragmatic, down-to-earth way. We sense ourselves when we're being resistant towards change, resistant towards others, or any type of resistance. And we ask ourselves, why do we have this resistance? A lot of times it's related to fear, one of the fears that were covered in Think and Grow Rich. Then when we start to remove those fears, the resistance goes away. And when the resistance goes away, non-resistance appears. And when non-resistance appears, we start to project a lot clearly. We start to make decisions faster. We start to live more in harmony. We might even do things that might not make sense to a lot of people, but for some reason, doing it the way from the deep intuition, or you could say it's infinite intelligence, produces the result. And I found this to be true myself in certain things that I've done in business. Some people are cheerful givers, but bad receivers. They refuse gifts through pride or some negative reason, thereby blocking their channels and invariably find themselves eventually with little or nothing. Part of this journey is to be good at receiving. Okay, there are people that are very good at giving, but they can't ask and they have a very hard time with receiving. By receiving, you're not completing the circle and the energetic flow of life. By not being open to receiving, you definitely will not be open to any insights, hunches, and inspirations that come from the infinite intelligence. There's always the perfect balance of giving and receiving. And though man should give without thinking of returns, he violates law if he does not accept the returns which come to him. The goal for example, in entrepreneurship, is to create so much value with as little raw material, as little input as possible. Create just an insane amount of value for the marketplace and focus on that. And then what you'll start to see is you'll start to see the returns happening. Okay, People will start buying, will just start giving you money in exchange. Most people fall way too short on this side where they think what is valuable should be reciprocated by money. And when they put it out there, it's not reciprocated. And then they blame circumstance. And we talked about this earlier. Well, the cause within is not recognizing that they're not putting enough value out. And what they think is valuable is not actually valuable. And thus, they need to change the cause from within. So when you keep putting that out there, as it comes to you and you receive the money, you receive the abundance. Have gratitude and appreciation for the abundance. Okay, this is the flow. This is not when you receive the abundance is not the time to pretend to be modest. And really, it's a form of shyness, a form of lack of self-confidence. But to freely accept and recognize that as you have sowed, now you shall reap. And it is with that reaping that you can nurture yourself, that you can care for yourself, and that you can reinvest back. So let's talk about faith. Okay, Faith is really important. Getting into the spiritual swing of things, it is no easy matter for the average person. The adverse thoughts of doubt and fear surge from the subconscious. 
They are the army of aliens which must be put to flight. This explains why so often, darkest before the dawn. So faith is in a way making a step towards the unknown, but believing that it's going to work itself out. And what I found is that it usually does. Actually, it always does in some shape or form. And I can speak from my experience in that. If there are times where I do not take action based on faith, and I don't have full faith, it doesn't really work out. Okay, and this faith is manifested to a lot of different things. In sales, for example, following the elements that we've covered in the way of the wolf, we did the discussion on Jordan Belfort's book, our acts of faith talks about the energy in there, and believing that what you have to offer is valuable to the other person and actually is valuable towards the other person and that you are going to do your best presentation to create value for them by ensuring that they buy what it is that you have to offer because if you did not sell them what was a benefit for them then you've been a disservice okay that's a reframe to drive the faith forward and there's many different reframes that we could use but faith is a important element because if you're just doing something and you're not doing it with faith, then you are setting yourself up for failure. Okay? And this is one of those games of life lessons that you'll learn along the journey. And it could be a, a tough one for a lot of people to grasp, but this is true. Okay, So when you act in faith, it's a confident act that not only influences the results, the intent behind it, but also... If it doesn't work out, you have faith that you will make it work and you're more likely to look at the optimizations that can come as a result, which is one of the core principles of direct response marketing. The meaning of the communication is the response you get. You take an action, you're going to get a response. And that response is either going to give you the results or it's going to determine, reveal to you how far or how close you are towards the results. It's going to give you some data in which you can optimize. Man must prepare for the thing he has asked for when there isn't the slightest sign of it in sight. Okay, now that's what we're talking about when we talk about faith here. Okay. A lot of times people spend way too much time looking for the right time and the right place to make the move. Way too much time. A lot of times they don't find it. That's not what faith is. Okay. One of the things you learn as an entrepreneur is how to have faith. And that's why entrepreneurs, when they get to a certain level, they think differently than most people. Okay? Most people do not operate with this kind of faith. Most people will see this as blind faith. They want to be able to see exactly how it's going to turn into the result before they take action. They don't recognize that that's not how life works. That may work for some things, but it doesn't work for other things. Other things, you have to have faith in order to be able to create the reality by taking either the small step or the big step forward. So in chapter 8, they talk about intuition and guidance. There is nothing too great of accomplishment for the man who knows the power of his word and who follows his intuitive leads. By the word, he starts in action unseen forces that can rebuild his body or remold his affairs. It is, therefore, of the utmost importance to choose the right words, and the student carefully selects the affirmation he wishes to catapult into the invisible. Intuition is a spiritual faculty and does not explain. It simply points the way. So we get this intuitive hunches, intuitive inspirations, which come from the subconscious or may come from the infinite intelligence. And this usually happens when we're focused. So we always talk about the importance of putting your attention and awareness on your burning desire, what it is that you want to achieve. And it's from that place that you get intuition. But here's the deal. You have to take action. You have to take action. And the action is a lot of times fearful. Okay? It's scary action. Because we mentioned this earlier, your paradigm doesn't want you to change. Not because your paradigm is evil, but that's how it works. And so what we have to do, and again, watch that video. I put a link in the description of the Bob Proctor, the terror barrier, is we need to go past that terror barrier. Okay, The intuitive nudge says, talk to that person, take that action, do 
the thing that you know you have to do that will accelerate your growth, start the business, leave the job, whatever it is, only you know what it is, and there's going to be some fear that comes up. But you're going to have to step away from that fear. Everybody who was ever in a position of fear that now has success had probably gone through that fear provided it came from the intuitive nudge. Now, we're talking intuitive nudge in the right direction, having fear and then taking action towards it. A lot of people misinterpret this one, okay? So this is, this is big. So people get the intuition, the insightful nudge to take the action. And then they get the fear that shows up because the fear is keeping them in their paradigm. And then they're confused because the intuition said, okay, move forward. But now this fear came up, so they become paralyzed. Analysis paralysis. They keep thinking about things over and over again, and they drive themselves crazy. When the way is to calibrate and grow in the journey and train yourself to trust the intuition, and you might make mistakes, yes, but you got to move forward and you got to get good at making decisions fast. Best way to do it is to get the intuitive nudge, take action, get another intuitive nudge, take action again, and keep going. Indecision is a stumbling block in many ways, a pathway. In order to overcome it, make the statement repeatedly. I am always under direct inspiration. I make right decisions quickly. So one of the things that's going to determine your success and how you win in life is your ability to make rapid decisions, rapid decisions. Now, we're not talking about making blind decisions randomly here. Trust that there's uh, very important polarities. Okay, So number one is to evaluate the large spectrum of data. Number two is to trust, have faith. Number three, recognize that you're going to have to make mistakes in life. And you're going to have to fall down. That's how you learn. And, you know, when you combine these elements and you make a decision based on it, even if the decision didn't work out, you get better at the decision-making process. Then what happens is you get to a point in life, and I can speak from experience, because I can make a lot faster decisions now, way faster than I did before, because I constantly put myself in situations where I'm making more decisions. And I'm okay to make a mistake, I'm okay to fail in my decisions because I'm training my decision-making muscle. Okay, training your ability to make decisions fast and trusting that you will get better at decision-making is one of the important elements of faith, okay, which is an important element of winning in the game of life. Next, non-resistance. Nothing on earth can resist an absolutely non-resistant person. The Chinese say that water is the most powerful element because it is perfectly non-resistant. It can wear away a rock and sweep all before it. Okay, very nuanced here. Non-resistance. If you try to grasp something too hard or a person, they run away from you. If you're too nonchalant and you, know, you don't take any action, you're never going to get any opportunities. The key is to be from a place of burning desire. Okay, have the burning desire while being detached from the outcome. And that is actually what faith is all about. My students often said, I don't want to be a doormat. I reply, when you use the non-resistance with wisdom, no one will ever be able to walk over you. So what's interesting about this is when you got non-resistance, yeah, you got an open heart. People could hurt you. But you won't find yourself around those people anymore. They won't be around. Very interesting. One is often cured by his faults by seeing them in others. Life is a mirror, and we find only ourselves reflected in our associates. One of the best exercises that I've ever done in personal development is to become aware, and it's an ongoing exercise. Okay, this, is a, this has been a lifelong exercise of the people around me and what they're doing, how they're behaving, how they're acting, both positive and negative, and use that as a mirror to who I am as a person. So what I found is that when I dislike somebody or if somebody does something that is irritating or suboptimal or just whatever, violating these principles that we're talking about right here, then I could do two things. Number one is I can get you know, frustrated and say, well, that circumstance and make it all about the circumstance, which is, you know, we've identified that so far. That's not how we want to be. Or I could take a step back and say, where am I doing that thing that they're doing? Where am I doing that thing? that they're doing, that they're revealing to me that I'm doing. 
And what's interesting is that I always find it with self-reflection. So try this. You will always find where you're doing that thing. If you can't find where you are doing that thing that they're doing, then you haven't studied as deeply the implications and impacts of cause and effect, which you will throughout this journey. You'll get better at it. But with time, and that's why, you know, usually individuals will find this to be true at later stages of life. In earlier stages of life, it's just everybody else's fault, not yours. In later stages, you say, oh, okay, I'm doing that thing. And they're revealing to me that I'm doing that thing in this other area of my life with that person in that situation, etc. And it's creating that same impact, the same result for that person or that situation. And so I can't really be angry at this person because they're a mirror. And to be angry at what they're doing would be disrespectful and not accepting myself that I'm doing it. Okay, this goes into the element of love. One is often cured by his faults by seeing them in others. Remember that. Which leads us to our third point, love. Real love is selfless and fee- and free from fear. Okay, Real love is selfless and free from fear. Okay? People might claim they know what love is about, but love is something that you get better at with, with time. You grow into it and you develop it And it's an ongoing journey because human existence, maybe, will always have some degree of fear. But the more we can remove our fear and maybe eventually get to a point, and I believe it's possible, where there is no fear, then we actually have real love. And it's selfless. It's not keeping tabs and saying, well, you know, we talk about all these things in, in business, for example, keeping a spreadsheet, but don't make that confused with real love and selflessness. Okay, It's interesting. Polarizing thought. On one side of the spectrum, you've got to be calculated. You've got to know your numbers. But on the other side of the spectrum, two polarizing thoughts in the mind at the same time, you've got to be selfless. Okay? You've got to recognize that there's a fairness and the focus is on creating more value, being more selfless. And you know, someone's resistance towards that idea reveals their lack of faith in themselves. And it's not something that you want to beat yourself up on just recognize that this is a journey. Everything we're talking about right here in this video, in this based on this book, is not something that necessarily can be learned in one sitting, one week, one year. It will be learned throughout this journey. We're just putting more awareness and focus on the certain elements. And as you progress on this journey, you get better and better and better at it. You eventually get a point in business where you're selfless. As interesting as that sounds, a lot of people might not agree with that. They're like, well, you can't be selfless in business. I disagree with that. I say you can be selfless in business. There is ways of doing it. And when you figure out how to do that, you will win. You cannot be taken advantage of. It pours itself out upon the object of its affection without demanding any return. Its joy is in the joy of giving. Okay? Its joy is in the joy of giving. Not Here's some joy, and if I'm not getting that back, then there's no joy. Okay? You get joy in the joy of giving. The calm, the strong, calm man is always loved and revered. He is like a shade-giving tree in a thirsty land or a sheltering rock in a storm. Who do not love a tranquil heart, a sweet-tempered, balanced life? It does not matter whether it rains or shines or what changes come to those possessing their blessings. For they are always sweet, since serene and calm. That exquisite poise of character, which we call serenity, is the last lesson of culture. It is the flowering of life, the fruitage of the soul. It is precious as wisdom, more to be desired than cold, yeah, than even fine gold. How insignificant mere money-seeking looks in comparison with a serene life a life that dwells in the ocean of truth, beneath the waves beyond the reach of tempests, in the eternal calm. That's a quote from As a Man Thinketh. Hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you very much for watching. If you want a copy of the mind map, the link is in the description. This has been a discussion on the game of life and how to play it by Florence Scoville Shin.